This evening, our pioneer that we're going to be covering is the 11th in our series of the 27 pioneers that we've been going through um, that we've highlighted in our Lest We Forget issues uh, in the past. Uh, and again, the issues will be online. They're not currently online, but they will be shortly. Uh, we'll be posting the PDF files of that. The one we're covering this evening is Josiah Litch. The issue that we did on him is uh, volume three, number four. And it's entitled, the lead article is entitled, A Remarkable Prophecy. So let's look at Jos Josiah Litch's life and see what we can learn from his experiences. His picture is the one right here behind me above my head, Josiah Litch. And uh, he's the, we have the 10 previous ones on the, my right. And uh, he's number 11 as we're now covering the, the other ones here. Hopefully we'll do um, several this evening as well. Josiah Litch, 1809 was the year he was born. And um, I apologize for the typo there. I was going to actually check to see how you, you pronounce that uh, town. Does anyone know how to pronounce the town in Massachusetts? H-I-G-H-A-M? Higgum? Probably. That's where he was born in Massachusetts. Um, a lot of these people, we don't know a whole lot of details in regards to their early years. Uh, 1826, um, age 17, he was converted. And the conversions of these people basically mean that's the time they gave their life to Christ. Um, whatever church they were, they became part of. Three years, uh, six years later, age of 20, uh, 24, I guess actually seven years later, he became an itinerant Methodist Episcopal minister. So he actually began uh, at an early age uh, working in ministry. Another five years in 1838, <coughs> he reads Miller's lectures, which had been published two years before. Again, just to review, when did Miller begin his public ministry? 1831. So uh, it was about five years after Miller began his ministry that, that his lectures were published. And two years later now, Josiah Litch is reading them. And according to the history that we have, he was convicted of Miller's positions, but he resisted the impression to preach it in case it did not come to pass, which is often, uh, you know, you want to cover your bases and not go too far on a limb, perhaps. But he had a dream that persuaded him to be willing to bear reproach for Christ. In other words, venture something. And he began preaching and writing about the doctrine. And so this made him, as noted here, the minister that's considered to be the first, the well-known minister that's considered to be the first to take up the Millerite teaching and to join William Miller in his work. The others that we've already looked at um, this man here, Himes, and the one beyond him, Fitch, Himes actually joined it in 39 the next year, and Fitch in 41, two years later. Remember a little bit about those histories that we've covered already. What did Litch do? He immediately, he wrote an article, June of 38, entitled, The Probability of the Second Coming of Christ About A.D. 1843. But in that article, I mean, it sounds like a good Adventist article, right? Christ coming, prophetic uh, timetable time there. But in that article, he did something that the other interpreters and, and lecturers had not done. He predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire based on Revelation 9. And this awakened much interest in the northeastern United States, this this prophecy, that he's, the application he's making of Revelation 9. Now, I thought it would be useful just to try to give you a little bit of an overview of what that's all about, and that's the next box below uh, what we were just reading there. Um, these were not published uh, the, the information here, the reference I have for this, let me say it that way, was not published 
in that first article from 1838. If you look at the footnote underneath the box, at the bottom of the box, this was actually published in the Midnight Cry, 1843, which was some three years after the fulfillment, right? Okay, so not quite three years, but going on three years. Let's just go through briefly over this. Do you remember um, the we've we've done Revelation after a fashion in our study group already? What part of Revelation is Revelation nine in? It's the trumpets. Okay. Um, if you have your Bible, you can open to that. Specifically, what trumpet is introduced in nine? What was that? The fifth, the fifth trumpet. That's correct. How many trumpets are there? Seven. So how many trumpets are left after chapter 9 begins? Three. Five, six, and seven. Now it's introduced by the last verse of chapter 8, which is uh, useful to, to reference here as well. In the chapter 8, the very last verse, he has an interesting statement. You see what he says there? John, I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice. Does that sound like anything else in Revelation that you're aware of? What? The three angels, Revelation 14. Okay. That's why Revelation 14 actually says, when, when you get to the first angel in Revelation 14, it says there, I saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven. That's why the first one in Revelation 14 says another angel, because this is where he saw something similar to that. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, it's very likely that uh, there's some significance between those verses, the connection between the two. And what is this angel saying with a loud voice? Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. So that's why the last three trumpets, fifth eighth trumpet, sixth trumpet, and seventh trumpet are often called what? Three woes. Three woes. In fact, the Bible itself deals with that. The fifth trumpet is introduced in chapter 9. And at, the, in, at, at verse 12 in chapter 9, what does it say? One woe is past. Two more woes are coming. You come to the end, and then the sixth trumpet is introduced. Then you come to the end of the sixth trumpet, which is over in 11, in verse 14. And what does it say? Second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. That was a significant Adventist text. Okay. And then, of course, the seventh uh, trumpet sounds, and there's no verse that I'm aware of that says... The third woe is past, but the seventh trumpet introduces judgment and basically introduces the last half of the book, which deals with uh, judgment in many, many details, re repeating, overlapping details uh, from chapter 12 to the end of the book. All the phases of judgment that we looked at, the investigative phase, the verdict and sentence phase, and the e executive <coughs> phase are covered in the rest of the book. So based on that, Revelation 9 is the first woe, right? And so that's where the table begins. The fifth trumpet, first woe. Um, he references it beginning with uh, Muhammad 6.22. And in that fifth trumpet, specifically verse 5, it speaks of five months. Five months of 30 days, prophetic days per month, adds up to 150 prophetic days, which would be 150 years. And he reckoned that time to begin when Othman began, became the sultan in July 27 of 1299. And it would take you down, obviously, to 1449. 1449 was the end of the, of the first row of the fifth trumpet. And the event that occurred then, the Greek emperor John Paleologus died and his successor, a man by the name of Diakosis, he asked permission of the Turks to take the throne. And by that action of asking permission of the Turks, this was the beginning of the Ottoman dominance. 
the Turkish dominance. Okay, and that then introduced the sixth trumpet and woe. And Lich found in the sixth trumpet specifically nine, <coughs> verse um, fifteen. He found a series of time uh, statements, hour, day, month, and year, that he and others as well saw as a time prophecy. And I've given you the math here. An hour is the, a 24th of a day, right? Mm -hmm. So the 24th of a year would be half a month, 15 days. And then a day is a year. A month is 30 years because it's 30, day, 30 prophetic days. And a year is 360 years, 360 prophetic um, days. And so you add up 15 plus 1 plus 30 plus 360, and you end up with 315 days, I should say. And then 1 plus 30 plus 360 years, you end up with 391 years and 15 days. And based on the calculations of these dates, you took, it took him down to August 11. 1840. And this um, we will see uh, he expected the Turkish dominance, the Ottoman dominance to come to an end on that day before the event took place. Prophecies in general are not understood mainly to let us know the future. But as Christ says, I've told you these things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, what might happen? You may believe. Or to build our faith as they come to pass. We need to be aware of them. A lot of times we can't even figure them out until they come to pass. But this, uh, this man took a, a venture in, based on the interpretation, prophet, prophetic interpretation principles, particularly the year for a day, he says, this, I believe, we can expect, as we're going to read here. And um, historically, well, let's just jump ahead, because I think we should read what he said just a few days before that August 11. Drop down to the bottom here of the first uh, side, August the 1st, 1840. How many days before? Ten days before. He puts an article in Himes' Signs of the Times entitled Fall of the Ottoman Power in Constantinople, the End of the Second Woe, Revelation 9. And this is his statement. Allowing the first period, he's going, reviewing again the calculations here, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled when Diakosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks and that the 391 years, 15 days commenced at the close of the first period, it will end in the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. Okay? So that's a statement. Now, um, Let's look at Loughborough's statements about what this caused in, the, in, in America, in, in the Advent movement. And this is right underneath the table, back there on the first side. In the book, The Great Second Advent Movement, starting at page 129, Loughborough makes these observations. In 1838, again, he's referencing the article that Litch first published after he decided to, to run with the message. In 1838, Dr. Josiah Litch of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, having embraced the truth set forth by William Miller, united in the work of giving greater publicity to the message. He prepared articles for the public print on the subject of the seven trumpets of Revelation. He took the unqualified position that the sixth trumpet would cease to sound and the Ottoman power fall on the 11th day of August, 1840, and that that would demonstrate to the world that a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year of literal time. Some of the brethren, even those who believed with him on this point, trembled with fear for the result, quote, if it should not come to pass, close quote, as he said. This did not, however, daunt him, but he went forward to do all in his power to give publicity to his views on the Turkish question. Public journals spread abroad the claim he had made on the subject. Infidel clubs discussed the question in their meetings and said, here is a man that ventures something. And if this matter comes out, as he says, it will establish his claim without a doubt that a day in prophecy symbolizes a year. And that 2300 days is so many years and that they will terminate in 1844. So you see what's happening. Yeah. 
if this prophecy shows that a year a day equals a year, that will give credence to Daniel 8.14. And we will then know that 1844 is also valid. The publication of Dr. Litch's lecture made a general stir, and many thousands were thus called to watch for the termination of the difficulties that had sprung up between Muhammad Ali, the Pasha of India, Egypt, I mean, and the Turkish Sultan. Hundreds said, if this affair terminates as the doctor has asserted, it will establish the year-day principle of interpreting symbolic time, and we will be Adventist. Very clear, right? What's happening here? Um, at the next year, after he first published this, he was continuing his preaching. He's 30 years old. Okay, He started this at age 29, so again, these are young people. And then comes the 1840 uh, episode, which we've already looked at, and the statement that he made 10 days before the expected event. On August 11, as the table in the front indicates, the Turkish Sultan put his empire under European dominance by giving the Egyptian leader, because they were having a squabble, he gave the Egyptian leader an ultimatum based on the European protection. He told this man, if you don't give me back what you took from me, because there was some you know, national uh, tug of war there over some assets and, and lands and things like that, he says, if you don't give it back to me, my allies, the Europeans, will make you do it. So they said this, he's given up dominance now, he's under the protection of the European powers. So that's, that's what took place, and it received, uh, the year-day principle received great support, strengthening the interpretation of Daniel 8.14, pointing to 1843-44. to 44. This is Loughborough's comment about that event. This is now on page 132 in the great Second Advent Movement. This striking fulfillment of the prophecy had a tremendous effect upon the people upon the public mind. It intensified the interest of the people to hear upon the subject of fulfilled and fulfilling prophecy. Dr. Litch said that within a few months after August 11, 1840, he had received letters from more than 1,000 prominent infidels, some of them leaders of infidel clubs, in which they stated that they had given up the battle against the Bible and had accepted it as God's revelation to man. Some of these were fully converted to God and a number of them became able speakers in the great Second Advent movement. Some expressed themselves to Dr. Litch on this wise. We have said that expositors of prophecy quote from the musty pages of history to substantiate their claims of prophetic fulfillments. But in this case, we have the living facts right before our eyes. So you can see the impact that it made on the interest in prophecy and on the conviction that the prophecies were actually um, dependable with those methods of interpretation. 1841, the next year, age of 32, in June, he leaves the itinerant ministry and becomes the general agent of the Millerite publications. Okay, So basically he's this is the year after the fulfillment, and I think the momentum is carrying him into full-time focus on the Millerite ministry and, and effort. Um, June the 15th, he joins with, with Himes at the second Advent conference. Remember, there was, in 1840, October, the first general conference of believers expecting the second Advent. We talked about that under, under Himes. This is the second one, second conference. Second Advent Conference, and he in Himes gave nine suggestions for evangelizing the message of the Second Advent. Very interesting points. You can read about it in the Lest We Forget periodical a summary that F.D. Nickel did of those nine points. How to, to spread the word. Your local libraries have material that's, that's available for them. When you have a chance, uh, ask your local pastor questions about Bible texts that deal with prophecy. <laughs> Form Bible study classes. Study, uh, schedule social meetings for prayer. Um, circulate the Advent books. And remain in your church and try to spread the word inside your, your local church. Those are some of the points that, were, that they covered. So very practical things that they were addressing. In July the next month, he became an editor for Himes' Signs of the Times. And again, don't forget, all, 
of the first eight volumes of Heim Signs of the Times are on the CD-ROM. The entire collections of these things. So you, it's an amazing collection of, of Adventist articles from 1840 through 1845. Covers right through the disappointment into the next year. Um, November of that year, he visits Charles Fitch. And uh, Charles Fitch, obviously, um, look back on the first page, that was the year that Fitch joins the movement. So apparently his influence is, he's influencing Fitch to, to uh, not only join the movement, but also to put his energies into it. So these are some of the uh, key men, obviously, that were involved with the Millerite movement. In this report that he, that, uh, of the uh, Second Advent Conference from June of that year, I've given you just a couple uh, short paragraphs reporting on that conference. You can see it's from the HST, means Heim Signs of the Times, and this is July 15. So this is the next month right after the meetings. Report of the second session of the General Conference of Christians Expecting the Advent of Our Lord Jesus Christ held in Lowell, Massachusetts, June 15, 16, 17, 1841. Again, the previous one was in October of 1840. The conference, uh, that was the beginning uh, report of that. And then uh, a few paragraphs later, you can see this first was paragraph 12 on page 61. This is paragraph 28. The conference then gave their attention to a discourse by Josiah Litch on the nature of the kingdom of God and the evidence arising from the prophetic periods of its being near at hand, even at the doors. So Litch is a prominent writer and speaker based on the background where he predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire He's giving now a lecture on the prophetic periods, probably that and other periods as well, of Christ coming being very near. Summer of 1841. 1842, he goes to Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and opens the work there, the Advent work. And in December, he wrote a refutation of conditional immortality. Now, this shows you the fact that these leaders in the Advent movement were not all agreed on what the group of Adventists that later became Seventh-day Adventists accepted as their fundamental beliefs, their, their landmark truths, one of which was the non-immortality of the wicked. We've already noticed that Miller rejected Storrs' view because remember Storrs was the fellow that wrote about this and that really spread this concept among the Adventists. But Miller pushed back against it and here Litch is pushing back against that, that view. Um, so again, they didn't see all the light, uh, even though the God was using them in the promoting the, the prophecies. The next year, 1843, continued work in Philadelphia and also now in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as well as Baltimore, Maryland. So you tend to think that the Advent movement was in New England. But this is coming down toward the south, right? And if you read carefully the history, we may have mentioned that even, that Joseph Bates made a trip into the eastern shore of Maryland and um, down, you know, getting, getting because they wanted to preach to the, to the slaves. They wanted to carry the message to the slaves. You're shortly going to be free, right? <laughs> Jesus is coming and he's going to free you. By the way, on my trip to Ohio, I went to Cincinnati and went to the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Amazing, amazing center. If you have a chance in, in Cincinnati, go there. Uh, because and before we went, the lady that I was staying with, we read, um, we read some of Ellen White's statements about because of our, our, a lot of our pioneers were abolitionists, <clears throat> very strong abolitionists. Remember this man here, the second, the first GC president. Remember what his home was in New York. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad. By the way, the Underground Railroad was neither underground nor a railroad. It was a, it was a sort of somewhat secret connection of homes and people that they would take the escaped slaves to as they moved them further and further north. Places they had quite often were underground under yeah. the basement. Some, some, Thompson, Maine. Thompson, Maine? Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. 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 Natives left off the edge. Oh, okay. Stockbridge Towers near the 
a lot of underground things. Really, tun tunnels even too. Wow. Now, see, they, before before the Civil War, they passed a law entitled the Fugitive Slave Law, which which made it illegal for people in the North to harbor runaway slaves. You could be fined and imprisoned for doing that. Ellen White said that is a bad law. We should not obey it, and we must abide by the consequences of not obeying it. So we read that before we went down there to, the, to see this museum. But when that took place, you weren't safe anywhere. They headed for Canada. They had to travel clear on through the north and you were going to Canada to actually be free. So it was really a, a horrible situation. And the, the, you know, these, a lot of the wealth of, of the colonies was built on slavery. Not just the plantations and the cotton in the south, but the slave traders in the south and the ship shipping companies in New England. Even though they didn't have slavery in New England, the shipping companies in New England became wealthy based on the, the slave trade. It really was a horrible... New Jersey has slavery. Pardon? New York and New Jersey has slavery. Yeah, New, yeah er, some of the er, uh, northern ones had slaves before, the, before that was done. Quakers were very active in the Old Dining Right. And, um, Quakers. A, a real interesting person, Bryce is Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman. Yeah, quite amazing. Right. She, she, she had a serious accident, just like Ellen White did. And, and she, uh -huh. she was walking through the Trinity in her uh -huh. dreams. And, and many times uh -huh. they, they would save you know, her from. Uh -huh. One time she woke up from this dream and she said, We have to get out of here. Oh, really? And, and then they came back the next day and mm -hmm. they saw the, 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 all this big trampled grass that so they had been searching. For. Okay, Harriet Tubman had dreams and was similar in some ways to. Parallels a long way. Yeah. The, uh, when we got to the museum, the first place we went was a large amphitheater. And they had um, some artistic ways of retelling some of the stories. Three, three different artists had put together, um, it, it, it was animated uh, artwork describing what, what, they, what, what happened. And the amphitheater was called the Harriet Tubman mm -hmm. Amphitheater. So. She was featured uh, very oh, clearly the there. Priest, they feature Sojourner Truth. Yes. And there's monuments there. Pictures of Sojourner was there in, in the Freedom Center as well. And I actually put, took pictures of my feet inside of her. Really? Footsteps. <laughs> she had very large feet. Uh, yeah. So Interesting. See where her house was. Yeah. So if you ever do get to Cincinnati, um, it's very useful to. Uh, what was the name of the museum again? National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, as I remember. Uh, that's the, the full full name for it. It's right there on the river in Cincinnati. The river in Cincinnati, what's across the river from Cincinnati? Kentucky. Kentucky. Right. And that is slave, a slave state, okay? And Ohio was a free state. And so they crossed the Ohio River. They were into, into the, uh, at least before they had the fugitive slave law, they were in safe territory. So that's why they put it. I think they were right there on the river to, to symbolize that. They actually reconstructed they moved from Kentucky. There was a farmer in Kentucky in the recent, recent decades that told them, as they were working on this Freedom Center, I have a slave pen on my property. And it's a building that's probably about the size of this room. Two stories, wooden, wooden big, huge wooden uh, um, logs that are flattened that are sort of dove, dovetailed on the ends. And they, they moved the whole thing and put it inside the museum and rebuilt, you know, they had to put a new, different roof on it. But it's the same, and his name is, the owner's name is inscribed on one of the logs. The upstairs still has the rings where they would, they'd hook the chains to. The men would be upstairs and the women would be downstairs and be the cooking. The women wouldn't be chained. Um, but the men had to be because the men would be the ones who, who would tend to run away. So anyway, it really graphically retells the story. And you realize then why Ellen White says God is going to punish this nation. God's going to punish this nation for what has happened. And um, that happened in, in the years, 20, 20 years after what we're talking about here. So again, we're back to Litch. He's down near the Mason-Dixon line by working in some of these states. Um, and again, summary statement, he wrote prolifically and preached eloquently, often holding the unwearied interest of thousands for an hour and a half as he spoke on the imminent return of Christ. So these were men of ability. 
who were effectively used by God to call attention to what was coming. In May of 44, he's 35 years of age, he wrote a review of the Advent movement. This is interesting. <laughs> Before the passing of the time, he's writing a review of the Advent movement, it, including his own story. It was entitled, Rise and Progress of Adventism. And this is, I find significant because later on, Jan Loughborough, his first history of the Seventh-day Adventist church is called The Rise and Progress of Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> so it's a very similar title. Do you have El this information that he wrote at that time? Uh, this Advent Shield, I do not have a copy of it. Uh, the articles in here about him reference it several times. Um, but it, it, as you can see, it's a, a lengthy article. It's 50 some page, about 50 pages almost. Um, it would be very useful to have as a distinct document online, and perhaps at some point we can do that. We have not computerized the Advent Shield. But it might be useful to, to consider doing that as one of the periodicals on some future editions of our collection. Um, but again, he commented in there, interestingly enough, on the timing versus the event. Do you know what I mean by that? In other words, this is the time period that the prophecy points to, and this is the event that we understand that it's pointing to. And he said the following statement, it remains to be shown that our calculations of time are not correct. In other words, we're pretty certain on that. No one has shown that our, that our calculations are incorrect. No one has been able to give any evidence that it's not. And are only in error relative to the event which marked its close. This is the most likely. Even before the passing of the time, it's very interesting that he considered the possibility. The time seems pretty definite, but the event we may not have exactly right. And that actually turned out to be the case from the view of the group of Adventists after the disappointment that became Seventh Adventists, right? So that's an interesting, that's on page 81 of that article in the Advent Shield, uh, May of 1844. Well, it was just genuinely accepted what the cleansing of the sanctuary was. Right. They should have been wary of that. Yeah. Anything, anything generally accepted by Any that general thing. understanding should have been <clears throat> critiqued uh -huh. very strongly. And the general understanding of the sanctuary was what? It was the earth. Right. And the cleansing would be Christ's coming. They didn't understand fully the, 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 the biblical sequence of judgment that was laid down in Genesis 3. We've looked at this before. was repeated more than once, even with the fall of Jerusalem in Daniel's day. It was, it was repeated by the fall of Babylon in Daniel's day. And again, that sequence is the first event of judgment is what? Investigation. Investigation opening the books in the language of Daniel 7. The next event in judgment is verdict and sentence. And the final event is the execution of the sentence. The second coming of Christ would be an act of executive judgment. It's not the first event. See, they didn't, they, they, if they had critiqued it, maybe they would have come to that even before the disappointment and realized even more so, let's be a little bit tentative about what's going to happen on that date. Um, it did obviously what they did do and, and maybe uh, we're clearly told this was in God's providence that he put his hand on that right because how much attention would, have, would, have, would it have caused or, or, or stirred up if you said in 1844 Christ is going to go from one place of his ministry in heaven to another place wouldn't have had the impact wouldn't have had the impact than saying he's coming here then, and, this, and this will be the end of this world and you better get ready, right? Then they were and particularly when, again, the 1840 prophecy came to pass right on that time timetable, they said, this must be true. <laughs> and it really caused, as we are already read, uh, interest in conversions of thousands. So God's hand was over. Uh, and I think that they're very, very likely uh, it unfolded as he intended. Not without historical precedence, right? Because the Christ's own disciples preached a message that was true, but their understanding of it was not. 
And they were disappointed when Christ was crucified rather than took the throne of Messiah to reign. It was the establishment of the kingdom again? Right. It was confusion over the establishment of the kingdom. And it was confusion, confusion over an event on earth rather than uh, the kingdom being established on earth. As Luke 19, I think it's verse 11, mentions, they thought it was going to immediately come, and Christ tried to warn them it's not going to come. That was before his crucifixion. But again, it seemed like uh, there was a hand over that as well. So. Well, we like physical realities rather than spiritual. We like physical realities rather than spiritual. We often focus on the physical thing. The disciples were focused on a physical kingdom here. And the Advent believers were focused on his physical coming to this earth. Now, both of those will come to pass, but they were not at that point on the timetable. And again, when you're ahead of God, you get disappointed. When you lag behind God, he gets disappointed. And that's Adventist history at a later date. Uh, those very words are used. 1902, as we read in the manuscript and published in 1904. So September of 44, Josiah Litch is baptized by immersion by Charles Fitch. Interesting. The, mo the month before the passing of the time, he gets baptized, you know? And then he in turn baptizes his wife, according to the, to the article that we have, in, unless we forget. Um, the next month, October the 11th, he accepted the seventh month message, sort of like William Miller he waits until the last month to accept the message, with October 22 as the date for Christ's coming. And this is his words, which was published, as you can see, in The Midnight Cry, October 12. He had obviously written it the day before. I cannot praise God sufficiently that he has permitted me to behold this great light. I feel myself humbled and now lift up my head in joyful expectation of seeing the King of Kings within 10 days. Okay. It's great light, the light of the midnight cry. Interesting that that imagery is used by him. And Ellen White, in her first vision, saw at the beginning of the path, what? A bright light, great light, shining all the way along the path. And the angel told her the light was the midnight cry. Midnight cry. So again, uh, this was the movement of which she said there has been no movement since the days of the apostles that was as free from human imperfections. And she described it like a tidal wave going across the country. Well, we know what happened, the passing of the time. What did Josiah Litch do after the disappointment? It's obvious from, from our history that he did not join with those that became Seventh-day Adventists. And though God used him in, in amazing ways in the Advent movement, let's, let's briefly review the wrap-up of his experience here. Um, May the 21st of 1845, the next year, he's 35 years old. He writes a letter to the Advent Herald stating that the error had been going on, he thought, for at least a year. Here's how he put it. I believe we erred and, erred and ran off our track about a year ago. That was his words. So what did he do? He joined with Himes, Bliss, and Hale, who believed the error was the time and that the event was still future, that the door was still open. They, did, they were not the short door group. The door was still open and would be closed when Christ returned. He opposed the shut door branch that a man by the name of Turner and our friend here, uh, Brother Snow, got into, Joshua Turner and Snow. And he also opposed the Sabbatarian branch that Brother Bates and Brother Edson, Brother Edson, and of course James White and Ellen White. But he progressively abandoned also his positions of prophetic interpretation. He was on the editorial staff of Messiah's Herald, another publication that was published uh, in that time, probably until his death, from what we know. And this shows you in 1873, now we're, he's age 64. This is, this is some years later. It's almost 30 years later. He writes a book entitled A Complete Harmony of Daniel and the, and the Apocalypse. 
and in that he repudiates almost every portion of Millerite's prophetic interpretation, including the year day principle. And what does he do in that book? Everything in the book of Revelation from chapter 4 onward is where? Future. He became a futurist. Okay? A futurist. Chapter 4 is everything after the messages to the seven churches, right? Mm -hmm. It's all future. Um, we need to learn from our history. <laughs> There's, there are still people that are tending to want to do that. Well, the devil uses certain tricks. He's used it on all of the rest of Christianity. Right. If it'll work on some of us, he'll do that. Right, he has a lot of options that we can believe in. You call them tricks, but they, a lot of erroneous variations that if it appeals to you, go run with it. Right. Right. There's one genuine, but there's many counterfeits. Yeah. And that's, that's what happened. And unfortunately, that, uh, that was basically where this man went. Yeah. And he died in 1886 at the age of 77. So again... What can we learn from this man, Josiah Litch? What, how did God use him? How did God use this man? Prophetic interpretation. Focusing, time, focusing on, the, on the prophecies, especially the time element, and the principles that you can use to interpret that. And he was effective at... at at showing how it does come to pass. Again, if he had just seen that the, as he, as he already th sort of thought might happen, the event was the major problem, not the time things, then perhaps he would not have given up the, the elements of prophetic interpretation that he did. It is.